a lot of people are just looking to sit on the money and just have it hold its value. Uh, you know, we're, we've got some dark times ahead of us. Like I'm not a doomsday prepper by any means, but I mean, the writing is on the wall, um, you know, with these lockdowns that have happened, with the war, with shortages, with diesel running out, with food, with more mandates. I mean, you just need a safe place. And for a lot of my people, foreign real estate just kind of ticks that box. And now they can sleep a lot sounder at night because of it. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Mikhail Thorup is the world's most sought after expat consultant. He focuses on helping high net worth private clients to legally mitigate tax liabilities, obtain a second residency and citizenship, and assemble a portfolio of foreign investments. Mikhail, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Sam. I'm very happy to be here. Amazing and show, amazing audience. Hopefully inspire a few people today. Man, I hope so. I'm, I'm pumped about this conversation. Mikhail, there are three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show. In 90 seconds or less, can you tell me, where did you start, where are you now, and how did you get there? Ooh, in 90 seconds or less. Okay, uh, I was diagnosed with a learning disability when I was a small child, and they pulled me out of school and sent me to a special school, and I was there for three years. And the only problem, Sam, was it actually was not a special school. It was a regular school with a special class. And I used to get in a ton of fights and picked on and bullied. And this is no woe is me story. I'm certainly no victim. And I got hit and I hit straight back. I would never claim otherwise, but uh, it left a very bad taste in my mouth for school. And um, long story short, I dropped out of school when I was 12 years old, or I stopped going to school when I was 12. And I officially dropped out when I was 15. And I started traveling the world uh, as a teenager and 22 years later, and I'm still at it. I've visited 110 countries. I've lived in nine, and I've circumnavigated the globe over 400 times. And during that process, I have learned just an absolute ton of secrets and different ways of doing things and options and abilities for, for going offshore and eliminating your tax bill and immigration and the different residencies and passports. So I am certainly no armchair traveler or armchair researcher on this. I, I really spend my time boots on the ground to go through everything. And I think that's probably why uh, my story resonates with a lot of people. Well, your story certainly resonates with me. I hated school from the day I showed up to the day, my last day there. Sorry to say it for all you educators and people here. I love, absolutely love to learn. I just hated school. Absolutely. Yeah, I was like, oh my gosh, please, no. Like you count it down, you know, there's 185 school days a year. You're like checking them off one at a time going, oh gosh, only nine more years after this. You shouldn't be doing that in third grade, I don't think. But either way, that's the way it was. How in the world did you come up with the business you're in now? Like, okay, so you're a teenager. I'm going to go travel the world, which probably you don't have time on the show to, to tell us all the backstory there. But how did you come up with the business that you're in now, how did you form it as a as a even a business plan? You said, "Hey, I think I can go out and make make the a business out of this." Yeah, so I mean, when I started traveling, I was doing whatever odd job I could, you know, working in hospitality, working in kitchens, doing whatever I could to make money. Eventually, I got into entrepreneurship and investing when I was in my twenties, and I actually spent seven years trading derivatives and doing okay at it. In 2016, 2017, around then, I decided that I really wanted to devote myself to just entrepreneurship. And I decided I wanted to take the two things that I love the most in the world, number one being investing and, and number two, living overseas and traveling. So I basically smooshed the two of them together and I created the Expat Money Show, which is my podcast, which we're about to celebrate episode 200 of. So that's wild to think over the last six years, 200 episodes. But um, I mean, that was really the genesis. I had been doing some some business consulting and things like that on the side, but uh, that really became my primary thing back then. And uh, and that's what I do full time now. And we have literally millions of people who read my stuff and, and listen to the podcast and uh, a lot of really satisfied people. Man, that's cool. What problem are you solving in the marketplace? Yeah. So what we have seen over the last couple of years is that people really realize that they need to have a plan B, some type of a backup plan and some type of political insurance. There's a lot of people who do not agree 
with the way that COVID has been handled, with lockdowns, with mandates, with all of these types of things. Now, I, I honestly don't care what side of the aisle you sit on, but from my perspective, it's about freedom and liberty and personal choice and personal responsibility. And I think that that is the absolute main thing that we're able to help people with is having that type of political insurance and having a plan B set up. So I get half my people who are just done with the States, who are done with Canada, and they want to move overseas. And another 50%, another half that need to have the plan B. And at some point, they might want to actuate that plan. But it's that really, really small niche. That's where I live, Sam. That I, I love the idea of a plan B and... I, th I would. I'm sure that in in what you do, people commonly throw up objections to why they can't plan B. What are some of those objections you commonly hear, and then how do you reasonably overcome those? So, one of the main things that I used to get is families. So people would say, "Oh, I can't do this because I have kids, or my wife is not supportive, or you know, this is." You know, I used to get told all the time, oh, this is great living overseas, but, you know, at some point you're going to have to come home and settle down and get a real job and, you know, start a family. I'm like, okay, I mean, I'm Canadian, Danish heritage. I met my wife in Germany. She's from mainland China. We got married in the Seychelles in Africa. My daughter was born in Abu Dhabi. My son was born in Brazil, and we live in Panama right now. So, I mean, like, if I can do this as a high school dropout and a dyslexic who told, who was told that, you know, there's his brain didn't work well and stuff like this, I can, and I have a family and I have figured out all, all these types of things. Like, literally anybody can do this. I mean, yes, there's a lot of knowledge. Yes, there's a lot of that has to go into it. And, you know, when I started, there was no one there to support. I had to figure this out myself. But now there's tons of resources we put out at expatmoney.com and all these types of things. So that's number one is, you know, I can't do it because A, B, or C, or I can't do it because I have a family or I have kids and they need to go to school. We actually created an online school to solve one of these problems. It's called Expat International School of Freedom on Entrepreneurship. If you go to expatschool.io, it's a completely virtual school. It goes from ages eight to 19. We've got uh, three different programs in there. And my business partner has been working in education for over 32 years. He's a published, twice published author, uh, international speaker, thought leader in the, in the ideas of Socratic thinking and Socratic thought. So we try to overcome any and all objectives that people have when they try to go overseas. Right. No, that's really cool. I guess here's here's a, a, a very uh, strategic question. Where are people going? I mean, the COVID lockdowns, whatever it was, the chaos of the U.S., I mean, it doesn't matter what aisle side you're on. It's all just a crazy show. I think a clown show in the uh, in the end. But where in the world is there is the grass even remotely greener? Yeah, absolutely. So it is the number one question is, where do we go after all of this? Right. Um, we've seen the most amount of freedom in certain places in Latin America. Mexico pretty much stayed wide open the entire time. We went to Brazil for six months during COVID, and it was like COVID did not exist there. You would see the random person wearing masks, but that was it. All the restaurants, the bars, everything was still going. Panama is very popular right now. Um, you know, I had a lot of clients coming down here to Panama. It's also good because the tax situation is fantastic in Panama. There's actually legal ways that you can really eliminate your tax bill. And it's one of the things that, that I do help my clients with. Uh, I mean, that comes with a ton of caveats and I'm not giving individual tax advice, certainly on a, on an open podcast like this, but we are getting rid of people's tax bills legally. Uh, Costa Rica is popular. Nicaragua is even coming up. They stayed completely open during COVID. There's different things in those countries. So it, you really have to balance what the person is after, what their objectives are, and their, their likes, wants, and needs in a hierarchy of different things. But yeah, I would say Mexico, Brazil, Panama, Colombia was doing quite well. And then they uh, elected someone not so great to the presidency a few weeks ago. So we're, we're still watching the situation there, but mostly Latin America, Europe, not many people are interested in Europe anymore. And not many people are interested in Australia or New Zealand. They had extraordinarily strict lockdown. So actually we're 
doing the opposite. We used I used to help people get to Australia. Now we're helping people get out. Uh, Asia, same thing. Not many people going to Asia at the moment either. Right. Yeah, that's the that that's really helpful. Thanks for kind of breaking some of those countries down in places where you know people are looking looking to expand their uh, their their freedom or at least just maintain the freedoms that they have. Tell me this: What does somebody need to have in net worth, in business, in dry powder, cash savings, things like that, to even begin thinking about doing these implementing this sort of plan? You know. It's really dependent on the country that you're going to go to. I mean, are you going to be able to go to, I don't know, Malta if you're making $1,000 a month? No, probably not. I mean, they have a citizenship by investment program. It starts at a million dollars. But there are countries like Nicaragua where the minimum investment for permanent residency there is only $35,000. That's quite affordable, I would have to say. That gives you a ton of freedom. You can come and go from the country whenever you like. If you have some kind of an online business, you know, you're a coach, a consultant, an Amazon FBA, you have real estate, um, anything like this, it works perfect because they won't tax you because it's considered a territorial tax system. Now, your tax in your home country, we would have to deal with that, but there's still ways around it. So, and, and in between Malta and Nicaragua, there's 101 options in between. But um, that could kind of paint a little bit of a picture. Yeah, if you have absolutely no money, then this might be very difficult. But you also, at the same extent, don't need to be a multimillionaire to go offshore by any stretch of the imagination. Right. Yeah. And I guess that's that's the question I think that a lot of people uh, you know, who are interested in this sort of thing think is like, What's the what's the quickest way to build that plan B now? Like, how do I implement that now? Maybe maybe I'm not a multimillionaire, but I need to find at least developing that plan B. And I guess so. So you've answered kind of the money question. How places like you know Nicaragua? You said it was uh, citizenship by investment, or was yeah, that Malta is citizenship by investment? Nicaragua is a permanent residency. Permanent so residency. It, it gives you the re- the legal right to live and work in the country for as long as you want. What's the difference between that and being a citizen? So the citizen, you're actually going to be able to get your passport. So that travel document, enter in uh, on that passport. For this, you would still use your US passport or your Canadian passport or your German passport or whatever it might be. Got it. Got it. What do you see people doing when you talk about foreign investments? Like what are people doing? Is it all real estate related that they're doing? Or what are people doing right now when you see your clients, uh, you know, for the first time diving into foreign investing? The majority is real estate. I mean, I really promote and and talk about and believe in tangible assets. I like things that I can touch and smell and feel and, you know, real stuff. Yes, we do condos and things like this and commercial real estate. We're also seeing a big boom in uh, agricultural land, uh, timber plantations, these types of things, things that actually produce, which are great for income in Latin America, you know, and we're always trying to pair some type of a residency or citizenship on the back of an investment. I'll give you an example. Panama has a program. It's called the Friendly Nations Visa. It's a $200,000 real estate investment. There's a couple other ways to qualify, but the best one is a $200,000 real estate investment. And I mean, it's not a government approved project, meaning you can get real estate anywhere in the country. Uh, We do your legal work for you. We go through the contracts. And this allows you to get your permanent residency here. So now you can come and go from Panama. You can live here. It works as a good plan B. But the best thing, Sam, is to keep your visa active. You only need to visit Panama one day every two years. Okay? So to put things in context, there's other countries that would need you to be there for six months. Or there's even some countries that want you to be there pretty much every day of the entire year. Maybe you can go on vacation for seven days, but that's it. But for me, I like these types of programs that have minimal commitment on the ground and then maximum freedom on the back end of that. Absolutely. How are people finding real estate assets to invest in in places like Panama or any of these other countries? I mean, and have any degree of certainty as to what it is they're getting into. Yeah. I mean, that's why a lot of people will come to me because I do a ton of due diligence with everybody that I work with. So we work in. 
I mean, the extended list of countries is probably 40 countries, but our core countries that I work in is about 21 or 22 different countries. And in all of these countries, I have real estate agents who check our contracts. I always highly, highly, highly suggest that you work with local representation. Don't try to read the contracts and do this yourself. There's just too much to it. Even I have tons of real estate investors from Canada and the United States. It's a very different ball, <laughs> ball game outside of North America, how things function and how things work. So someone would come to me, they would work with me. I would introduce them to the lawyers. We could deal with the tax issues. We deal with the real estate developer or broker or real estate agents. We would see how we want it structured. Is it going to be structured in your own name? If so, what are the tax consequences? How are the filing requirements? Same if it was going to be done through an, AB, uh, an IBC or an LLC, or if we wanted to put it in a trust or a foundation, what are all of the obligations with that? You know, the closing times, is it title deed, is it leasehold, everything like that. It's a pile of things to work through. So I suggest that you work with a professional and certainly local representation. Are people buying income producing real estate or a lot of your clients, is it just buying it so that they can then acquire either permanent residency or citizenship? I kind of have the whole gambit, to be honest. Um, a lot of people are are looking for income producing, but at the same time, I have an equal amount who are just looking to park money offshore. They know that inflation is through the roof right now. The published amounts are probably twice what they've been in the last 20 some odd years, right. but you know the unofficial numbers are likely much higher than that. So real estate is an excellent option for someone who wants to just hold the value of their worth. And traditionally, we know that real estate keeps up with inflation. So you move your money offshore, you get it outside of your country of birth. It can protect you in a lot of ways from litigation. There's a lot of ways that we can do things privately, anonymously, You know, especially when we're using different types of structures like a foundation. And a lot of people are just looking to sit on the money and just have it hold its value. Uh, you know, we're, we've got some dark times ahead of us. Like I'm not a doomsday prepper by any means, but I mean, the writing is on the wall, um, you know, with these lockdowns that have happened with the war, with shortages, with diesel running out, with food, with more mandates. I mean, you just need a safe place. And for a lot of my people, foreign real estate just kind of ticks that box. And now they can sleep a lot sounder at night because of it. Outside of maybe the COVID lockdowns and, you know, some of those maybe having less restrictions, I guess, what, what are, why are these countries such as Panama or Costa Rica or Nicaragua, why are those good places to go to? Is it, I guess, what makes them more favorable over somewhere else? Yeah. I mean, there are many different reasons. I'll, I'll, tell you a couple of mine. If you're actually going to spend time in the country, we're talking about food independent countries, water independent countries. I personally like Panama a lot more than Costa Rica. Costa Rica is really highly dependent on their tourism sector. Now, Panama does have a tourism sector, which is excellent. And we get foreign direct investment coming in because of that. But we also have two other really important things. Number one is the Panama Canal, which brings in literally billions of dollars a year into the economy. You know, this will also bring products and goods and services into the country because of the canal itself. But one of the other things that a lot of people don't know and understand is that Panama is actually the center of the banking sector for Latin America. So what ends up happening as countries turn socialist like Venezuela and Peru and Bolivia and you know hopefully not Colombia but we'll see what happens the business owners the factory owners the people who have wealth the entrepreneurs the people who create things they get their money out of those countries and the first person the first place that they move it to is Panama and the first thing that they do is they put it into real estate now, this is not a market which is highly leveraged. It's going to be extraordinarily difficult to get a mortgage here. So people are paying cash for things, which means it's very, very stable. So as I said, we've got the tourism industry that has lots of money coming in from that. We have the Panama Canal. We have the banking sector. We have the real estate market. And then we have it as the center of the offshore world. So there's more in companies incorporated here than anywhere else in the world outside of Hong Kong. And we're seeing a massive exodus of companies from Hong Kong as China gets more aggressive 
with Hong Kong. So they're moving things out of there and they're moving to a safer jurisdiction like Panama. Does that make sense? Uh, it, it makes all the sense. I mean, no pun intended. It makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. So that's uh, that's absolutely awesome. Those, I mean, that, those are, and I love what you said there about food and water independent countries. I think that's, that's, uh, that's something that people just aren't really paying attention to right now is where, where, where are things going on a food supply basis? I mean, we've got, we've got an absolute war on energy. We've got a war on food, as you've seen, uh, you know, here recently with where was, where was the tractor, the big tractor convoys? Was that, in, was that in the Netherlands? Where was that? Yeah. There was a big one in the Netherlands with the manure and going to the, uh, Yes, <laughs> government buildings and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. So, so we've and we've we've got the head of what Exxon here recently saying that that there'll never be another refinery built in the United States, another another oil refinery. So we've got a war on energy. You've got a war on food. Fertilizer prices have gone bananas. My brother's a, a farmer up in Ohio, and he owns like five thousand acres, and he's like, my gosh, because I called him. I called him earlier this year. I said in like January, I said, hey man, have you have you locked in your fertilizer prices for this year? He's like, no, not yet. I was like, dude, the writing's on the wall. It's going through the roof. And then like three months ago, he called me. He's like, dude, fertilizer prices have gone through the roof. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I told you this was coming. And like you said, the, the, you know, the diesel shortages, fuel shortages, food and water independent countries. I mean, that's, that's going to be a critical uh, and a place where food can grow year round. Yeah, like, I lived in the Middle East in Abu Dhabi for eight years wow. and I had a great time there and it was beautiful and it was very safe and it was a great place. But when I saw the writing on the wall, I was like, no, I've, I got to get my family out of here. I mean, literally everything is brought into the country. They're building 11 nuclear reactors there. I have a friend of mine who sits on the board of directors for, for the project. And he was telling me as soon, like day one, when the projects go live, 60% of it will be going to desalination for water. They're so behind in their water production that 60% of the nuclear power will be going straight to that. And I'm like, I don't want to be in a country which is so dependent on energy for these one things. And it's like, I needed to get somewhere where we have rainfall, where we can grow everything. It's all like a volcanic soil here in Central America is basically you know, how this was formed. So you just take a seed, you throw it in the ground, and tomorrow you have a fruit tree and it's producing. I, I'm being silly, but I mean, it's true. Like anything and everything grows here. This makes me feel a lot more stable and secure. Right. Yeah. Hands down. Hands down. And you, and you, and and being in a place like Panama is a place where people want to go. That's where. <laughs> that's where. That's where. You, like you said, you're you, you're attracting the the some of the 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 best producers in the world. If all your businesses, all your business people from socialist countries, people in Hong Kong, they're like, "Hey, I'm out. I'm out, yep. and we're going to go somewhere else where our interests can be protected." Uh, and we can continue to thrive, then they're just going to come into that economy and it's just going to get that much stronger. Exactly. That's uh, that's really, really cool. Mikhail, I love what you're doing. This speaks uh, very, very near and dear to me. So I appreciate you coming on the show today and kind of just sharing with us what you're doing for you and for your clients, how you guys have thrived living around the world, the uh, programs you guys are putting out. And it was expatmoney.com is your website, right? Correct. Expatmoney.com. Cool. Expatmoney.com. So make sure we certainly uh, certainly check that out. I know you had several other resources on there. If our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So we're actually doing an online summit. It's November 7th to 11th. Tickets are completely free. There's no charge to attend. If you guys go to expatmoneysummit.com, expatmoneysummit.com, you're going to be able to pick up a free ticket on there. Now, we do have a paid ticket. We got a VIP option. If you guys want a bunch of bonuses and a lot of other cool stuff, that's great, but it's certainly not mandatory. And if you're just curious about these things and how they fit together and the tax strategies in different countries and the residencies and the real estate options, then you got to check out the summit. We're putting on a ton of things. Um, we were talking before the show, Sam. Uh, my friend Doug Casey, he'll be a speaker. Ron Paul is going to be a speaker. We've got some really, really fantastic people this year. So expatmoneysummit.com. That is fantastic. Mikkel, thank you so much. Appreciate you coming on today and have a great rest of your afternoon. Pleasure's all mine. Thanks, Sam.